This is Tuesday Cafe. We're broadcasting from the studios of WMNF in Tampa. And we're going to turn now to our next topic. Two years ago, the FBI raided the Uhuru House in St. Petersburg. Then last year, three members of the African People's Socialist Party, or the Uhurus, were charged with covertly spreading Russian propaganda and illegally interfering in U.S. elections to sow discord in U.S. society. We're going to speak now to two of the defendants. The, they are known as the Uhuru Three, and they'll go on trial starting next Tuesday. And uh, we, they are joining us by Zoom right now. And I want to welcome in Omali Ishatella and Jesse Neville. Welcome to WMNF's Tuesday Cafe, Omali Ishatella. Can you unmute yourself, please? I see that you're muted. Can you unmute? Hi, Jesse Neville, are you there? I'm here, yes. Hello, Sean. Hi, thanks for joining us. And we're trying to get uh, Omali Yeshatella unmuted. But uh, thanks for joining us. So what can you tell us about what happened on the day the FBI raided the Uhuru House? So, uh, yes, hopefully uh, Chairman O'Malley will will be able to join us um, shortly. But in, in the meantime, yes, I would say um, um, on July 29th, 2022, the U.S. government through the FBI, uh, its uh, secret political police carried out a uh, pre-dawn coordinated uh, military style SWAT team violent raid on seven homes and offices of the Uhuru movement including the home of Chairman Omali Ishitela, and the leader of the African People's Socialist Party and the Uhuru Movement, and his wife, who's also a leader in the Uhuru Movement, uh, Deputy Chair Onazene Ishitela in North St. Louis, Missouri, along with several other properties, uh, including the Uhuru House, where I'm sitting right now, uh, the historic African Community uh, Organizing Center and cultural space uh, here in South St. Petersburg. And uh, they handcuffed uh, Chairman O'Malley and others. They uh, they came with flashbang grenades. They came with battering rams and uh, carried out this um, you know six or seven hour uh, process of looting these properties of of uh, decades worth of archives and electronics, phones, notebooks, calendars, uh, and nine months later came out with a bogus indictment against uh, Chairman Omali Ishitela, uh, Penny Hess, who is the chair of the African People's Solidarity Committee, uh, and myself uh, on manufactured charges that Chairman Omali Ishitela and the Uhuru Movement have been working for the liberation and unification of Africa and African people for over 60 years had suddenly become pawns in a, in a so-called Russian conspiracy to sow discord in the United States. And one of the things that the FBI said was that that this Russian national, Alexander Ionov, he was charged with secretly funding black political groups and directing them to pro publish pro-Russian propaganda. So um, this, you, what kind of connection, what kind of contact did you have with Ionov? Well, the, the, uh, the charges are, are completely uh, preposterous. Uh, and untrue. Chairman O'Malley Ishitela and, and the Uhuru Three are not guilty of these bogus charges. And I see the chairman has just joined us, so I'm going to defer to the chairman. Welcome okay. to Tuesday Cafe, O'Malley Ishitela. Uh, how would you like to respond to that? Thank you so much. Uh, again, I just want to say that uh, all of the charges that they made against us are, are, are just absolutely absurd. Uh, they would try to compress 60 years of history, of our history. It's been consistent. Uh, it's been a part of your history at WMNF, uh, the work that I've been doing. And uh, and it's always been consistent. There's nothing that different now than we're doing than what we did then. 
And uh, in terms of uh, the Russian government paying us to do anything, we've never uh, taken a penny from the Russian government. We had a relationship uh, uh, with a non-governmental organization uh, in Russia, just as we've had relationships with non-governmental organizations in Spain and other places. And the fact is that I think they claim that over a six or seven year period, we may have, they, that this non-governmental organization may have made something like a six or $7,000 contribution uh, and uh, to the work that we were doing. Uh, there is there is nothing that they will ever be able to show uh, that the Russians directed us to do anything that that they will never be able to show they they took uh, uh, enough uh, terabytes in terms of uh, materials from us as I understand it to, that uh, equal to something like twenty five million books and yet they will never be able to show anything uh, they can show statements that I've made uh, to comrade. Uh, 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 Jesse and he to me and Penny Hess, et cetera, they can show, uh, uh, but they will never be able, they can, they say they, they claim that uh, this man, Alex Ionov was a Russian agent. Uh, uh, that's what they say. Uh, uh, but they said W.E.B. Du Bois was a Russian agent. Uh, uh, like they say, I'm a Russian agent, uh, but they will never be able to show anything uh, where uh, there was a communication uh, between the Russian uh, uh, and and our party, our movement, uh, that uh, uh, that we were accepting directions or leadership from the Russians. They can't show that. They they can show that there were instances, uh, a lot of instances, perhaps where we had the same position. For example, around the war in Ukraine, uh, uh, our position was the same. Therefore, that meant the Russians are the ones who. Uh, that meant we were working for the Russians. Uh, the Russians supported uh, uh, verbally uh, our position around reparations or or the opposition that we had to genocide and the thing that we were taking had this is, goes all the way back from our own party to 1982, uh, where we had an international conference inside in Brooklyn, New York, uh, charged the United States with violation of the United Nations Convention on the Crime of Genocide as it relates to Black people. So there is, you know, it's absolutely absurd what it is that they have uh, charged us with with having done. So this man, Alexander Ionov, who is a Russian national and was charged as well by the FBI, you went to Russia and you met with him in 2015, but you're saying that uh, he wasn't an agent of the Russian government. You were just talking politics. I don't know if he was an agent. <laughs> I asked him at one juncture if this organization this anti-globalization movement that they were part of, I asked me one time if it were something that was uh, uh, funded by the Russian government or was the Russian government, and he said no. But I went to Russia uh, because uh, we were offered an opportunity uh, to come and meet with uh, groups from around the world, uh, many of whom had the same kind of interest in terms of uh, struggle against colonialism for self-determination. And they came from Spain, they came from Ireland, they came from uh, from Hawaii, they came from various places around the world, Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, so we were we we look forward to that because we the, the struggle of our people uh, could not get any traction when it come to bourgeois media, to the media that's controlled by this country. So uh, to break out of this encirclement was really important to us, and to win support from all around the world. That's why we went to Russia. And uh, we met with a lot of different people uh, who expressed unity, solidarity uh, with our struggle. And uh, we were opposed, and I wanna be clear on this because uh, uh, we were opposed to what the United States was doing through NATO uh, uh, in terms of this, in this, this attack on Russia that had been going on for something like eight years, even before uh, uh, it broke out in, in, into much of the public uh, attention uh, outside of Europe, perhaps. Uh, so, and we uh, had seen this attack on Russia that was something that started more than a hundred years ago, right after the Russian Revolution, when uh, all of the colonial powers, including the United States and Japan, invaded Russia uh, because Russia was connected to the struggles of oppressed peoples around the world and was talking about working people coming to power. And so we saw that happen. And we saw that since that time, there's been an ongoing process 
of uh, of uh, uh, aggression against Russia. So we didn't see history just beginning. We didn't even see it starting just with the uh, CIA involvement in overthrowing the uh, the the Ukrainian government in 2014. I don't, there's not even much debate around that. Uh, we didn't uh, even uh, see it happening uh, when the United States uh, contrived and created uh, the, the the modern jihad uh, through helping uh, to destroy the government of uh, Afghanistan because it was on the board of Russia and because it was a friend of Russia, uh, uh, et cetera. So we're saying it started even longer than that. So I guess even different from the Russians. <laughs> Yeah. Our guests are two of the Uhuru Three, Omali Yeshatella and Jesse Neville. They go on trial next week. This is Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. And I'm going to read from a, a an amicus brief that the National Lawyers Guild wrote in on behalf of your case that goes to trial, as I said, beginning next week. The Chicago chapter filed a 25-page brief in support of the three defendants regarding their First Amendment and what the Lawyers Guild says is the historical context regarding suppressed Black political expression. Defendants' alleged misconduct is inextricably intertwined with their political views, government su governmental suppression of Black voices, and political expression in the United States. So this is the National Lawyers Guild Chicago chapter uh, backing the three of you in your defense against these charges by the the uh, FBI, uh, your what are your thoughts on on what we what I just read there? Jesse, do you want to comment on that? Uh, sure, Chairman. Yes, I think the the uh, amicus brief filed by the National Lawyers Guild Chicago chapter was very important, and it was uh, bolstering arguments that were set forth uh, brilliantly by one of our attorneys, Leonard Goodman, who last year filed a motion for the dismissal of this bogus indictment based on the grounds that the indictment itself, let alone uh, what the outcome of the case could be, but the indictment itself constituted a blatant violation of the supposed constitutionally protected First Amendment right to freedom of speech. This law that they're using to target Chairman O'Malley Shatella and the Uhuru movement this uh, it's called the Agents of Foreign Governments Act, 18 U.S.C. Section 951. This is, according to Leonard Goodman, Attorney Leonard Goodman, the first time in U.S. history that this law has been used to target pure political speech in every previous instance, which is not to say that those were uh, those were legitimate prosecutions either. But nonetheless, in every previous instance, when someone has been charged under 18 U.S.C. 951, they've been accused of something beyond speech, whether it's espionage, uh, bribery, corruption, uh, um, you know, something to that effect. But in this case, every single so-called overt act that the United States government alleges was carried out in furtherance of this uh, this bogus uh, conspiracy is free speech. It's publishing a petition to charge the United States government with the crime of genocide against African people. It's holding a tour to speak out for reparations to the black community. It's holding press conferences using the Burning Spear newspaper. So this is also a free press uh, question that we're looking at. And not only is it constitutionally protected free speech, but it's free speech consistent with more than 50 or 60 years of political work by Chairman Omalia Shatella and the African People's Socialist Party, which has been consistent in its message and in its agenda of pursuing the self-determination of African people and winning international support around the world for the struggle of African people for their liberation. That's why so many people from around the world have rallied behind this case from across the political spectrum, because they see it as the, the tip of the spear for the struggle for democratic rights and free speech. And that's why on August 31st in St. Petersburg, Florida, there will be a massive anti-colonial free speech rally with people from all different organizations and, and political backgrounds coming together to say, drop the charges on the Uhuru Three and hands off Chairman O'Malley Ishatella. And that will be on August 31st at 11 a.m. at the Uhuru House in St. Petersburg at 1245 18th Avenue South. And Amalia Shatella, if convicted of these charges, you could face up to 15 years in prison. That's right. And uh, I think that uh, I think there's a serious intent to imprison me for life, uh, which is the equivalent of uh, of a life sentence for me. I, I, uh, but it's consistent uh, with uh, 
what is uh, talked about in the amicus brief from uh, the National Lawyers Guild, this the ongoing assault on on a certain kind of politics coming from our, our community, from the African community. You don't see there are certain organizations, black organizations, some of them have been around for a long time. You don't see the federal government uh, making pre-dawn rage on them and uh, uh, making these kinds of accusations. It's a political politic of self-determination. The fact that uh, we say that African people have a right to be a free people, be a self-governing people, that we live in a very hostile environment that it was imposed on us at gunpoint. It's not like uh, the fallacy about America being some kind of nation of immigrants. We say America is not a, a, a nation, it's a prison of nations. And Black people did not come here as immigrants, we came here as captives. And even when you look at uh, the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, et cetera, you're talking about something uh, that was ratified by the United States Congress in 1791. Black people were enslaved in 1791. It wasn't for us. And that's just an absolute truth. And they can't get around that truth with flashbang grenades and armored uh, 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 personnel carriers attacking our homes and stealing our resources and trying to poison the uh, opinion of the people uh, in this country who are likely uh, to have to serve on, jur on, on a jury uh, trying to create a situation where the people will ignore the fact that they have no evidence except that we are Black, except that we are radical, except we believe in self-determination, and except that we went to Russia. And of course, you can't have Russia and Russia, Russia, and Black, 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 and saying that in the same uh, sentence uh, uh, without uh, a certain serious, uh, insidious kind of uh, uh, inference. And that's what the prosecution, that's the only thing it can do. It cannot it cannot uh, 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 really uh, legitimately uh, assume that they have evidence that can do this. They have. They hope that they're, they've con they've created enough prejudice uh, within the body politic of this country uh, for that to work. Uh, for our audience who may not know, tell us a little bit about the history of your activism, Amal Yeshitela. Well, I'm. Uh, uh, I, I was a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Uh, that's the organization that uh, put the uh, the slogan demand black power uh, uh, on the agenda in this country and much of the world. It was the bridge, if you will, uh, between the anti-racist civil rights movement and the anti-colonial uh, black power movement. That's what uh, SNCC was the organization that put forth the, the black power demand slogan. In fact, one of the chief uh, uh, proponents, one of the chief uh, people uh, associated with the black power demand, he's going to be here on the 31st of September with the rally that we're going to be having. And so that's my history starts, uh, uh, that organized history uh, with Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And I became the Florida organizer, Student Nonviolent. I did voter registration work. Uh, I, uh, you know, was, was, was doing that kind of civil rights and voting uh, rights, uh, voting education work, um, even before the passage of the civil rights bill that, uh, that Joe, that Joe Biden opposed as a senator, even before uh, this whole notion about uh, busing that Joe Biden opposed uh, as a senator, saying he didn't want his children to have to go to school in a jungle. This is the government that's attacking me right now. So I was a part of that. Uh, I was a part of uh, a movement here and did a tremendous amount of work here. Uh, when Martin Luther King was killed, I was uh, I was out. Uh, I had been out on bail for four days on appeal bond uh, because I had been arrested in 1966 on December 29, 1966, for tearing an eight by ten foot uh, mural, horrific uh, mural uh, at the seat of local government power, uh, hanging that had Africans. Uh, portrayed in, in just horrendous kind of caricature. And uh, when the government refused to remove it, I took it down. I was with some other people and we took it down during a demonstration. I got sentenced to five years in prison for that. I was out on appeal bond uh, for that charge and, and uh, going to Gainesville, Florida uh, to participate uh, uh, in a rally to free some other people, young people uh, from arrest and then I got off the bus and 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 learned that King had been assassinated. So you know I was involved there. They they I was the first person arrested in the state of Florida uh, for inciting to write a law a law that uh, that they had just created, uh, uh, and where a riot wasn't necessary. I just had to want one to happen. It was a thought crime. It was speech crime. You know. So this is part of my politics. Yeah. And I want to thank you both for coming on Tuesday Cafe. Jesse Neville and Omalia Chatella, thank you so much. Thank you.
Jesse Neville and Omali Yeshitela are two of the defendants known as the Uhuru Three. They go on trial next Tuesday. There will be a march and rally this Saturday beginning at 11 at the Uhuru House, 1245 18th Avenue South in St. Petersburg. Thanks to my earlier guest, Kathy Celestri. If you missed either of these interviews, you can watch them on WMNF.org. This has been WMNF's Tuesday Cafe. I'm Sean Canan. Coming up next is Wavemakers with Janet and Tom Sherberger. They talk with the Sarasota School Board member, Tom Edwards, who was reelected last week despite opposition from Governor Ron DeSantis. This is Tuesday Cafe. Thanks so much for listening to WMNF Tampa, and thanks for your support for community radio.